Do you remember the TV ad likening depression to being followed around by a little storm cloud? How quaint. Picture this instead. One of those little creeks that's pretty low most of the time, so low that a sapling has grown up in the middle of it, about four feet tall, tall enough to hold a small swallow's nest. It's lovely, really, until a storm comes. The little creek has turned into a raging river, the kind that scrapes muds from the bank that threatens to rip the sapling out by its roots. The tree is whipping all over, bending on the edge of breaking, and then you see that there are three baby birds in the nest, three tiny swallows calling out for their mother, their mother who is trapped on the other side of the bank, unable to save her sons from the raging water. I am that sapling. I am also that bird. This is mothering with depression. I diagnosed myself with depression when I was 23. My physician agreed after I had presented her with the evidence, and I was then properly medicated and sent on my way. It wasn't until I was pregnant with my first child that depression became a true force to be reckoned with sending deep roots down in invasive shoots throughout my life. The healthy baby police recommended that antidepressants not be taken while pregnant. And since I was going to have the world's most perfect and pure child, I could surely live without them for nine months. Because after all, I was feeling fine anyway, and they were just happy pills, weren't they? No. Martin Luther King Day, 2002. I sat huddled in the corner of my bedroom, sobbing, trying desperately to disappear, and my husband trying desperately to find something that would help me. I was terrified, swallowed up by darkness, hopelessness, utterly convinced that the baby growing inside me not only deserved better, but might not even make it so thick and poisonous were my thoughts. He called my OB. Emergency appointments were made. Therapists were contacted. Prescriptions called in and restarted immediately. And I sat in the corner and wept. Why? That's the thing about depression. There is no why. My husband and well-meaning loved ones can ask, their voices thick with concern. But what are you sad about? But there is nothing. There is nothing specific and everything all at once. In the last 10 years, I've learned a lot about what it means to have a mental illness, because that's what it is, a mental illness. As a mother, you could tell me that I had almost any other chronic illness and I could be braver than with this. High blood pressure, fine. Diabetes, okay. I don't mean in any way to belittle other illnesses, but there are few other illnesses that come with this threat. They could take away my children. That's the reason you try not to go to mental illness. I've seen the movies. There always seem to be shock treatments and shuffling slippers and terrified visiting children. You hear mental illness and you think of mothers who have drowned their children because voices told them to do it. You think, no, that can't be me. I can't be one of them. I love my children with my whole heart. It makes me sick to my stomach to hear about these crazy mothers. I can't bear to think about it. But then you do. In the quiet of night, in your darkest, loneliest moments, some voice that you can't turn off tells you exactly what you don't want to hear. They loved their children too, but they were mentally ill. You are mentally ill.
the quiet voice won't stop pointing out the similarities, no matter how long and hard you beg it to stop. So I'm vigilant. I take my medicine, I see a shrink, I see a therapist. I pay attention to how I feel, and when I feel the world closing in, I try to take a breath and push back. My husband, Tom, is the most perfect ally I can imagine. After 10 years and three children, he consents when I need an emotional vacation. He will encourage me to take entire weekends to disappear just to refine myself. Tom has saved my life and sanity on many an occasion, which I know is not what he signed up for when we were 19. But just because I'm so self-aware and so well supported by my caring network doesn't mean I still don't fall prey to its grasp. That's the scariest part of it for me. I know what to look for. I know how it feels and I know what to do. But somehow, it seeps in through some invisible cracks in my strong, competent exterior and suddenly, I'm shocked to find myself consumed by the most terrifying question of all. What's the point? When you come upon me in that moment, you will know. My eyes will have a hopeless cast and a kind of emptiness that's not familiar. I'll be smiling, but you'll be able to tell quickly that it barely cracks the surface. I'll be paying attention to my children in only the most basic way, and even though I will still be loving them with all my heart, I won't be able to show them, and that will kill me. There is an awareness, as if I am watching from above, looking down at myself, seeing this strange, sad woman robotically care for her children and wondering why. The feeling is what I imagine a discarded piece of clothing must feel like, thrown haphazardly down onto the floor, unable to move on until someone picks it up. Pick me up, please. Pick me up, because I will not be able to ask you to. I will not know until you have done it that I needed to be picked up. That's the worst part of depression. We often don't know how bad it was until the clouds have parted. This depression, this mental illness, has a strong genetic component. And in every depressive state I've entered, guilt has been waiting to meet me at the door. Look, he always says. Look what you have given your children. This thought alone crushes me. Any parent at all wants their child to live a life, healthy life, free of as much darkness and despair as possible. And here I am, handing out darkness and despair, along with blue eyes and short stature. The guilt is deep and thick, and it's so easy to slip on that storm-ravaged bank. The key, the hardest part, is to make every step strong and have faith that I will not stumble. My therapist has told me that my boys are lucky because I know, I understand, and I watch. These words are my talisman when it gets dark, when I can find nothing but shame to pile on my back for bringing these three perfect boys into this world tainted with my sadness. The darkness and despair still tries to pull me down once in a while when the sky is dark and the waters are rising, but I will do everything I can to keep it from getting those boys. Because you know what happens to that sapling over time in the creek? It grows. 
It grows into a tall, strong tree that withstands any storm that rushes at it. I am that mother bird trying to get to her sons, but I am also that tree 